Welcome to the Francisca Show podcast on jewishcoffeehouse.com, the show where I give a voice to Jewish issues, topics, and people. I'm Francisca, your host. Just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Purim is in the air, and it's so exciting because I'm releasing a collab song and video that's brand new with 11 other vocalists on the song this week, and it's so exciting that it's happening and that it was able to just come together so quickly. So stay tuned for that. And over the weekend, I did release my first English EP. EP is used for a shorter album. So it's four songs. The links will be in the show notes. The throwback episode for this week is What If You Hate Your Child with Geli Asafsky. The link is in the show notes for you. And I'd like to share a beautiful new initiative slash nonprofit that I just learned about. I thought it was so beautiful that I wanted to share it with you. So Kesser Menucha is an organization that was founded in memory of my dear cousins, Morty and Mary Friedman's daughter. The name itself, which is Hebrew and translates to a resting crown, was chosen to reflect the dignity and respect the organization holds for their daughter. And a part of this organization is the newborn swaddle set donation. The package is a beautifully wrapped, new, incredible quality swaddle hat and mittens matching set. The package is intended for anyone and everyone located in Baltimore. There is no vetting process and it is open to all. From a new mom that is overwhelmed in the hospital to a mom who just had her 10th child to a mom of a NICU baby to a mom who was just told her baby has no heartbeat. Request a swaddle set. I will actually link this website in the show notes as well. Why did you choose swaddles? Sometimes a non-necessity can make the biggest impact. When I was in the hospital on the most traumatic day of our family's life, as I delivered our daughter, stillborn, all I had was a matching swaddle blanket set with a headband in my hospital bag to wrap her in. The ability to wrap her in something adorable, fresh, and new made all the difference in those large moments that we got to spend with her. Although the pain was heartbreaking when we saw her, she was only good and pure. In the hours after we said goodbye to our daughter, I knew I wanted to impart that same feeling onto other parents who are struggling. Whether the struggle is health, money, or anything else, a child is the biggest blessing in the entire world. When parents will look upon their new child in a stressful time, they will see their baby wrapped with grace and simplicity in the clean swaddle sets and feel that feeling conveyed through Kesar Manucha of blessing and joy for their child. The link is in the show notes, and this is available to anyone in Baltimore. This podcast is a Jewish coffeehouse podcast, so check out the other podcasts on the network. I am looking for some new guests, ideas, and stories to introduce on this podcast, so keep reaching out with your ideas and with your feedback on existing episodes. I love hearing from you, and let's get started. Welcome back to the Francisca Show Friends Dance. Today with us, we have Bracha from LA, and we're here to talk about genetics, prenatal genetics, and Jewish life. Welcome to the show, Bracha. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for having me, Francisca. I'm looking forward. So let's just start with the basics. Why is genetics important, and how is it related to halacha? Just before we get into your background a little bit, why is this relevant or even a concern? So uh, genetics is a huge field, and I specifically, I'm a genetic counselor. I specialize in prenatal genetics, so that's people who are pregnant or are trying to get pregnant. And genetics are important because genetics make the world go round. Like the chances of having, you know, a healthy pregnancy or having a specific condition, everything in our lives, everything that we are and will be is coded by genetics, by our DNA. Specifically in pregnancy, I would say, which is the area that I focus in, everybody wants to have a healthy baby. And so our field is something that can try and help people have a healthy baby, or if they're not going to be having a healthy baby, try and help them prepare them for that pregnancy, prepare them for what may happen after that pregnancy. And I would say the world that we're living in right now is, I think, just incredible with what we can do with somebody who's pregnant. With genetics, we can tell them a lot of information about the baby before they're born. And certain tests, which we'll get into a little bit later, can give us a lot of information about the baby. 
and, and are very cool and new and cutting edge. But as Orthodox Jews, we play a very interesting dichotomy of we live in a modern world and yet we are bound by ancient traditions. And so being able to kind of navigate those two worlds, I think is very important. I call myself a dual citizen. So I get to, I get to be part of both of those worlds. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about both your religious and professional background. I grew up in Canada. I grew up in Toronto, actually. I did like a classic Jewish Orthodox education. I went to like Beis Yaakov for high school. I went to seminary in Israel. I always thought I would be a doctor for many, many years. And that's kind of always what I thought. I had like a, my own kind of personal journey and struggles uh, with infertility. And after a lot of kind of thinking and soul searching, I decided that being a physician was not the path that I wanted. And through a lot of just, again, soul searching and life experience, I ended up being a genetic counselor because I really wanted to be part of a profession that helps people who are pregnant for sure, one, but also could help make an impact on my community in a positive way. And you know, there are not a lot of genetic counselors definitely at all worldwide where there's a shortage of us, but there's definitely not a lot of orthodox genetic counselors. And I am really happy to be able to be filling some of that need in LA and beyond. So what does a genetic counselor do? Let me just guess, if I may. <laughs> you have a couple who's either going through infertility treatments or a couple that's already pregnant. And they're looking for guidance on the information they have and what to do with that information or what decisions they have to make. Is that the ballpark of what you do? It's one kind of piece of the puzzle. So we can see people who are pregnant. It's related to pregnancy, what I do. Other people will do cancer or neurology, other different types of genetic fields. But I'll see people who are interested in either getting pregnant or currently pregnant I can see people who have a personal history of a genetic condition. So they have a family member who's had a genetic condition. Okay, but what do you actually do with them? That's my question. What's the process? So the process would be, again, depending on why they're there. So genetic risk assessment. So learning about their family history. We take a three-generation family history from both sides of the family to assess risk. We would go through testing options. So whether that be invasive testing options like an amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling or non-invasive options like NIPT or serum screening or... Okay, can um, you break this down? I don't understand sure. any of those words. No okay. worries. No worries. I just I'll, know I'll Doria Sharim. I know NYU testing. That's You're good. You're good. So that's one kind of bucket. So there's things called carrier screening. And that's going to be specifically looking at genes or instructions in the body for spelling changes. We typically all have two copies of every gene. We get one set from our moms, one set from our dads. If there's a spelling change in one of those genes that causes them not to work, we have a backup copy. So our body just follows the backup copy. We call one person a person with one working copy, one non-working copy, a carrier. And somebody who's a carrier doesn't show signs or symptoms of the disease. So the whole kind of background, I'll, I'll use Dari Sharm because that's the example that you gave of something like that organization is people who were walking around healthy and they didn't know that they were a carrier because their working copy of the gene was working. They would have a child with someone in the Jewish community who was very likely because of Jews marry Jews to carry the same non-working gene. And then every time they would get pregnant, there was a one in four or 25% chance that their child would get no working copies of the gene and have a very severe genetic disease. Tay-Sachs is a big one that we all know about in our community, but there are a lot of other genetic diseases as well that we can screen for in pregnancy. The Jewish community, we typically do that before we're having kids, but that's kind of only one aspect of what we do, carrier screening. And um, a lot of the times people will test in pregnancy we see something on ultrasound. We think there's something going on with the baby, a genetic issue. So we want to do what we call an amnio or CVS. Those are diagnostic tests where we either take a sample of the placenta or a sample of the amniotic fluid, the water surrounding the baby, to look at the genes or the chromosomes, that, that DNA, those packages of DNAs or specific instructions for changes, for missing or extra pieces, for spelling changes. It would really depend on why the person was coming to me. And 
a huge part of genetic testing is talking through the pros and cons of that, right? Do I want the information while I'm pregnant? Do I want the information after I'm pregnant? Am I willing to take the risk of an amnio, which has a small but real risk of miscarriage? Or am I uncomfortable with that? And so a big part of what we do is we facilitate decision making. We help people kind of go through the options and see what's best for them personally. The biggest question for me is, what's the information that people get? Like what examples of information do people get from doing these tests or screenings? And what choices halakhically do people have to do anything about it? It's a great question. So what information? So for carrier screening, like we said, carrier, not a carrier. For things like testing for Down syndrome. So a lot of people now routinely do testing for Down syndrome when they're pregnant. I know I did when I was pregnant. The blood test, it's a screening test. So whenever I talk about screening, it doesn't tell you yes or no if a baby has a condition. It tells you high risk, low risk. A not carrier, but high risk or low risk. Is it a high chance that this baby has Down syndrome or a low chance or one of the more rare chromosomal disorders? So for example, a woman comes to me and she did that blood test and it says that she's high risk for Down syndrome. The question now becomes holistically, what do I do with that information? Do I confirm it with a diagnostic test, like an amniocentesis that can tell me yes or no? Do I wait until the baby is born? What do I do? And I am obviously not a rabbi. I would consult with a rabbi if that's what my patient had wanted, but there's a lot of holistic question to that. For some people, there's a lot of halakhic question of if I find out a result like Down syndrome or a more rare chromosomal disorder, can I terminate this pregnancy? Am I allowed to terminate the pregnancy? And there's a lot of halakhic question that goes into that. There's also, I mean, Down syndrome is just a classic example, but in a pregnancy, so there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of kind of birth defects or major genetic issues that can happen. And so, you know, when a rabbi is taking that into account, again, I am not a rabbi, but They take into account information that we can get. What's the probability that this person can live, you know, a a healthy life? What's the probability that they'll survive? How long will they survive? Things like that, which can be helpful for us to be, you know, assisting them in their halachic, you know, decision-making process. Take me through an example of somebody who comes to you. Give me the most classic type of scenario you have and what happens exactly. And choose a more interesting case. Yeah, more interesting we can do. Classic would be somebody who's just pregnant over 35. Anybody who's pregnant over 35 gets to see me because there's an increased risk for chromosomal abnormalities like Down syndrome. Nothing usually too interesting, but their testing is usually fine. We go over it. They feel a lot better. They move on their merry way and they have a great life. You're like a referral from the doctor after they take their test. I am somebody who works with an MFM or perinatologist, which is a high risk doctor. So your regular OB will refer you to me in conjunction with the perinatologist, we work together. And a more kind of complicated situation, I'll give you an example of something that we had seen. Somebody had come to me, they did a big carrier screening, they were not Jewish, and they came back as a carrier for a pretty severe disease that was X-linked. It's on the X chromosomes. We all have 46 chromosomes. Females will have two X chromosomes. Males will have one X and one Y, which meant that for this person, If she was pregnant with a boy, there's a 50% chance that if she passed that on to her son, she could pass on the non-working copy and her son would have this disease, which is very severe. The child would be progressively, you know, immobile until they died in their 20s and you would watch your child die, right? If it was a girl, 50% chance carrier, 50% chance not. And, you know, the question becomes... What's the most important question to her? What's the gender of my baby? Because if I'm having a girl, I feel a lot better. And if I'm not having a girl, well, then I have bigger decisions to make. We kind of went through everything. We decided on doing something like the NIPT testing, which is that blood test that looks at, you know, a few different chromosomes in mom's blood that come from the placenta typically match the baby. And the idea was if it was a girl, she wasn't going to do diagnostic testing like the amnio where there is a slight risk of miscarriage. I keep saying slight because it's less than 1%, but for some people that feels very high. And the flip to that was if it was a boy, she would, you know, go ahead and do that testing. Don't have the result yet back, but she's waiting on that for her. So that was another one. So because I recorded Bracha a week and a half ago, I decided to follow up with her right before releasing this episode just to find out what the results were. And she did respond that 
the results came back that this lady's having a girl. So hopefully that's good news. And back to the show. I would say some more interesting ones that I find interesting is when the NIPT comes back positive for one of the more rare conditions. So NIPT, for anyone who saw, they did a big New York Times article about it. It was a big like scandal expose on NIPT. It's an amazing pest for Down syndrome. Everything else, not so much. This person came back for a more rare chromosomal disorder, like they trisomy 13, where somebody has an extra copy of the 13th chromosome. That's a condition that's not compatible with long-term life. And woman comes to me incredibly stressed out. I can't have a baby like this. And again, these tests are done early. They're done at 10 weeks. We go through together kind of based on what the, this particular lab that she used, what the chances are that this positive test is a real positive was something like 10%. So 90% chance that it was a false positive, which obviously changed her viewpoint a lot because a 90% chance that my results are not accurate makes me feel a lot more calm as a woman versus a 90% chance that they are positive. So going through that risk was very helpful for her. And I always say that to people, if you get a positive result of one of these tests, you need to have a genetic professional work through that with you because positive doesn't always mean 100%. Sometimes it means something like 2%, a 2% chance that this is a real positive. And I think women in pregnancy, they have so much stress as it is. Having a result like that can be very stressful and having proper interpretation matters. It really, really does. So it begs the question, should women be even testing? Also, it's, as I a Hashkafa mean, question, from a Jewish perspective, not just from a stress slash I would be nice. I think it's a really good question. It's, it's a tough one. I'm happy you're asking it. I would say a woman should test if she understands what the test is. So a lot of the times the doctors, the OBs will just say, go, you have to have your blood done. We're going to draw a bunch of things. They don't even realize that they've had this test done. And then they only realize when it comes back positive and they say, I don't want this test. Why did someone do that for me? It's very important to be asking the questions of what test are you doing? And what are, you know, what are the benefits, limitations of this test? From a halachic standpoint, you know, every rub is going to be different. I think in California, the test that I talked about, that NIPT is standard of care here. Every woman who's pregnant is eligible for that test. It's pretty common. But I think you have to say to yourself, is this information helpful for me during pregnancy? So, for example, if somebody says to me, I have patients who say to me, I'm very religious. I'm never going to terminate a pregnancy. Whatever it is, I'm keeping the pregnancy. Would the information, if you found out in pregnancy, be helpful for you to emotionally set yourself up for support? So if your baby is going to be born with something that's very severe, would you call out maybe a family member from out of town to come and help you with your other children? Would you choose a different hospital or doctor so your baby had the best chance of survival? Things like that, I think, are very helpful. I think the other piece that we talk about is screening. So we use these tests, but really an ultrasound is screening as well. And I do believe that every woman should highly consider having the big anatomy ultrasound. That's the one they do at about 20 weeks, because that really can be a difference between life and death for a baby. If a baby has a cardiac defect, a heart defect, where their heart is just organized in a different way, if they're not born at the right hospital, they can die. If the baby is born with a kidney issue and they need special care or something in their, their digestive tract and they need a surgery right after birth, this can be the difference between life or death. So I think not every screening is for everybody, but I would say if you're going to do one screening, make sure it's that anatomy ultrasound. For the screenings that we do now, it's not for everybody. I've had patients who say, I don't want to know that information. It will just stress me out in the pregnancy. Knowing yourself and knowing how you would react I think it's the biggest key. And obviously, if you know, you're consulting with a rev, you can ask as well. How do you work with patients that come to you or who are adopted? We recently did a series. Well, we had two guests who are adoptees. And how would you help them? They probably would want your help more than, meaning they might seek this more than your average prenatal patient because they actually are seeking this information. Yeah. And I will say I have people who are adopted, but I also have people who just don't know a certain side of their family, meaning my dad left when I was a baby. I don't know his family. I don't know anything about them. 
whenever we have somebody who's from a situation where we have limited information about family history because they're adopted, because their parent was out of the picture, because they're not speaking to their family, whatever it is, we can't do a full risk assessment, meaning it's limited. And what we'll often say is we'll do things based on ethnicity or ancestry. So I think something that's really tricky is when they don't know their ethnicity. So if I, you came to me and you said, Francisca, I'm assuming you're an Ashkenazi Jew, but I can't make assumption. Are you Ashkenazi? I'm Ashkenazi, yeah. Bold assumption. But, you know, if you're an Ashkenazi Jew, you come to me automatically. I say to you, have you had the following carry screening done? What's tricky is I've had patients who said, you know, I was, I'm from Russia. My parents, you know, found me at an orphanage. They have no idea where I came from. I don't know if I'm Russian. I don't know if I'm Armenian. I don't know if I'm, I don't know, you know, Asian. I don't know. And I think that becomes hard. And what we will often do is do a bigger carrier screening for them. We'll do what we call pan-ethnic. So across all the boards to try and figure that out for them. But it is something where, you know, if they have, I don't know, a really strong family history of cancer, it's just not something that we can assess. We don't know what we don't have. So the medical history really plays a big role. It's not just genetics. It does. And it also can tell me different things. So for example, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, I had a brother with a heart defect. My uncle had a heart defect. They were all born within a mite and my, I don't know, great auntie had one. I'm going to tell them they should have a fetal echo while they're pregnant. So that means a special of like ultrasound of the heart with a cardiologist versus if you came to me and said, I don't really have a history of cardiac defects. That's not something I would recommend because we know things run in families. We know things like heart defects can run in families, even if it's not part of a bigger genetic condition like Down syndrome. Sometimes they just do. I want to say one thing before I move on to my question is very often, and I learned this actually on the episode that Orthodox Conundrum, Rep Scott Kahn did an episode on abortion. And it was so obvious, but it was the first time I thought about it. Very often, the family that suffered and is going through infertility is also at risk for needing abortion or to need, need to consider terminate a pregnancy because of the baby that they worked so hard to, to have it has defects or very small chance of survival past whatever days, weeks, months. So that, that just brought a light a lot to the topic of pregnancy termination. And the other side of it, there are people who have reached out to me saying how children with syndromes, you have such beautiful lives, they create, it's, it's not something you choose, but it changes their lives. They bring so much precious energy to the family and they wouldn't give that up for anything. So that point over there. And then you have this trend. I wouldn't call it trend, obviously, but there's this understanding in certain Hasidic communities that in large families, if they find out or after birth, they find out that the baby has a syndrome or is born with Downs, they give the baby up for adoption. And that's also very common. And I don't know about their termination rates, but I know giving their baby up for adoption in Hasidic families is common, is something that's done. So I just want to address all these things and see if you have what to add to the conversation from your experience. I want to say something on the record for anyone who's listening, who is somebody who hates, like people in the prenatal genetic counseling community get a lot of hate from the Orthodox community because they think we're all on a witch hunt for termination. So I am saying blanket statement before I say anything else. Our job is not to tell you whether to terminate a pregnancy But it would be illegal for me not to say that that was an option because you are an Orthodox Jew, meaning I don't discriminate based on religion. I can tell you it's an option. You could say that's not an option for me and we move on. But nobody is trying to come for your baby. I think you bring up a really good point. And I had a I had this conversation with a friend. I think there is a huge trend uh, for people to terminate for Down syndrome. And that's their choice. I don't judge anybody. That's what they want to do. But I will say there are a lot of moms, like you said, who have babies with Down syndrome and say, this is my easiest child. Like this child brings me light and joy. And why are we trying to rid the world of people with Down syndrome? Like, why is that? Why are we on a witch hunt for Down syndrome? I think that's a very fair point. And I, as a genetic counselor, it's something where we have to be very careful to make it clear that if you want a baby with Down syndrome, meaning you want to continue that pregnancy, that's fine. And we can find people's support. 
to meet other moms or families with Down syndrome and get them that support. But I think it's very, very important as providers not to push people down a road either way to say, you must keep this baby or you must terminate this baby. It's really a personal decision. Really believes that, I don't know, I think people with disabilities make our world more beautiful. I don't think that getting rid of people with disabilities is the way our field should be ever. Again, raising a child with a disability is a very, it's a very serious lifelong path and a parent should be informed if that's what they want. Just an, an interesting anecdotal story that I think in my training, it changed the way I viewed things really for the rest of my life. I met someone, I trained in England. One of my my rotations was in England at a big hospital there. And uh, it was a tremendous opportunity. But a lot of the patients that we saw in England, just the way their health system works, were much more severe. So it wasn't Down syndrome. It was very, very, very severe things. Met a woman who was pregnant with her second child who had a very large piece of that baby's chromosomes missing, like a big chunk. If you can imagine chromosomes are bookshelves, she was missing a whole shelf of books, that baby. And the baby was already showing like heart issues and swelling and like was having seizures in utero, like very severe. And, you know, we talked with her and, you know, she's 20 weeks. Do you want to continue this pregnancy? Do you want to terminate the pregnancy? And she had said something which kind of changed my life forever, which is I want to continue this pregnancy because this is my baby. I think it was a boy. I want to meet him and I want to spend time with him. And if that's going to be two days, it will be time that I get to spend with him and bond with him and love him as a mother. Like I want to hold my baby. And I think, I think it really changed my viewpoint a lot of this is a really termination. It is an emotional thing, especially in our world. It's people who very much wanted these pregnancies usually, like you said, and are making very, very difficult decisions. And my job is to support you whichever way you go. My job is to make you feel supported if you want to hold your baby and if that's only going to be a week or two and you want to make sure that they're cared for and loved, that's my job. If you feel like, and again, if you're Orthodox, if that's with, in conjunction with a rub, that termination is the right place for you, then I'm here to support you as well. I think just to your point about Down syndrome, I think the firm community can often think of like, if something's wrong with the pregnancy, it's Down syndrome. In our world, like, there's so much more that can be going on with the pregnancy that down, than Down syndrome. There are things where babies are born without organs. Our babies are born, their brain is outside of their body. Their spinal cord is leaking into their body. Things like that, their lungs are being pressed up into their chest. They can't breathe. It really, I think there's a lot, especially in the climate in the states that we're in right now, of emotion around abortion. But I beg of you, anybody who is just learning of somebody else having a termination to understand that there's a lot more that people terminate for than just Down syndrome. Not that that's not enough, but I people don't understand in the firm community what can really, Baruch Hashem, what can really, they don't understand, but really go wrong in a pregnancy. And, you know, the decisions are hard and it's it's hard. And many people hide behind the word miscarriage or pregnancy loss without acknowledging that decisions had to be made and they had to be proactive about it. You mentioned the words personal choice, and I mm -hmm. can just hear mm -hmm. or feel that some people listening may think or feel that when it comes to lacha and these kinds of life decisions, life and death decisions, that personal choice is in contradiction with halacha or Torah observance. Can you talk more about this dynamic? I think it's a good point. I am somebody who's halachic, absorbent Jew. I have a rav. I ask my shilas to my rav. I will say that halacha is never black and white in most of these scenarios. And so there are situations where people will be told, you can terminate this pregnancy, no problem. And somebody will personally choose to continue the pregnancy. So I just want to say that somebody may be born with a very severe birth defect that the baby will live minutes after they're born. I'm not talking hours, I'm talking minutes. And a rav will say... I'm thinking of one specific birth defect, you can terminate no problem. Not every Rav, but many Ravanim will say that. No no consensus ever. What's the birth defect? Right. Something like anencephaly, where like they're missing like a good chunk of their skull. And again, it's just not co compatible. 
I don't speak for all Rabbanim, but I know many Rabbanim would tell you to terminate. And some people will say, no, I don't want to terminate. That's a personal choice. I also will say, and I've, I've learned this throughout, you know, just being part of the firm community and being a woman that's pregnant and being part of this industry, just because somebody is Orthodox, they choose to go to a Rav. Meaning some people will choose not to go to a Rav because they are embarrassed. And I know that some people are going to like to hear that, but it does happen. I don't judge people who decide, I don't want to go to a rub. I want to make the decision on my own. That's between them and their, you know, like I said, personal choice. Going to a rub is a personal choice. You choose to involve halacha. The rub is not with you in, in the <laughs> gynecologist's the office. <laughs> He's not there saying, let me tell you, you choose to go to a rub. That's your choice because you choose to follow a certain path, a certain set of standards. But even personal choice, I think, is an important piece specifically in when Rabbanim are making halachic decisions, a woman's emotional state or feeling about a pregnancy and continuing it is important. I think a Rav takes that into an account. If somebody has, you know, serious, I'm using mental health because I think it is important and it doesn't get brought up enough, but serious mental health issues, they can't manage with what they're dealing with by themselves. Maybe they have another child with special needs already and they have several children and they're struggling financially and their baby was born with a serious chromosomal disorder that might be important to put into the halachic, you know, calculation of, of whether they're going to be able to terminate. And so I think everything in life is a choice. You can also go to a rav and he tells you something and you don't listen. So I think your, your personal choices are, do I listen to the rav? Do I go to a rav? I think there's all that in there. We all have personal choices. How they play out is different. But even somebody who says, I'm going to do whatever a rabbi tells me, that's your personal choice. My next big question for you is, why did you choose this field? And what's behind <laughs> what's behind this? I think this is probably like, I always say like- I know I was you want to most... help people, but this is such a sticky, it's not sticky. It's, you're you're in it's, it's like it's a therapist. Charged. It's, charged. it's charged. I would. That's what I would say. It's a very charged field. I'm going to take like three steps back and say like, I always thought I would be a doctor. And then like, I just, it never sat with me. I'm like a person where like, if I do it, I do it all the way, right? And I'm like, I'm not spending 10 years of my life if I'm not committed. I am actually somebody who grew up and my one of my good friends in high school, her sister was a genetic counselor, prenatal, just like me. And I remember like my 10th grade science teacher was like, you should do that, Bracha. And I'm like, no. There is no way I want to sit with angry, grumpy, pregnant people. No. Like, I never thought I would do this in a majillion years. I ever thought that. And then after I finished my bachelor's, I was teaching for a long time in high school. I loved teaching. That was like a big passion. And I worked in all girls. So like educating women is my jam. Like, I love that. And then when I went through infertility myself, part of that process was meeting with a genetic counselor. And then it kind of clicked for me. It was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like, I want to help people who are going through pregnancies that are difficult. What about that experience made you feel like that was an integral part of your experience? I think going through infertility is really, really, really tough. And there's a lot of unknown factors. Um, am I going to get pregnant? When am I going to get pregnant? How? Whatever. All those things. And I felt like the genetic counseling was offering people a very, I don't want to say like definitive, but it was a very helpful lifeline in a very, very difficult process. Like you are somebody that can provide help to people who are struggling. And it's also genetic counseling is, I always say I teach grownups, like genetic counseling is teaching for grownups. So I was like, I have that skill set. I, I want to do something medical. I want to do something where I, I really do feel like I'm making a difference. And I had all the schooling because I had done pre-med, right? I had thought I was going to become a doctor. So I had all the prerequisites and genetic counseling is really, really hard to get into. There's just not that many schools. And I was put that on the back burner. I was dealing, I had my first child, being a new mom, being overwhelmed. And then I got pregnant with my second son. And I was like, I don't know if you felt this way, but I'm like, two babies. Like my life is, you know, my life is going to be busy. I was like, I need to do this now. Like I need to apply now. So I applied when I was pregnant with my second son. And I figured like, if I meant to get into genetic counseling school, 
I'm, I'm meant to get in. Like I, I wasn't a classic applicant. I was older. I didn't have like the classic genetic counselor experience, but I figured that was what was I was going to do. And we had to stay in California because that's where we live. Our kids are here. I interviewed nine months pregnant. I was the only person at the interview nine months pregnant and I got in and the rest is history. But I think the big thing for me was to, to really answer your question is I wanted I wanted to make a difference in times of people's lives that are hard and be maybe not somebody who can give them all the answers, but give them support. And I also wanted to be a resource to the Jewish community. So when we grow up, we know all about Ashkenazi Jewish disease. Like we are in like from high school, we know Doria Sharm, Tay get that done. You know, they put 12 graders in some places on folic acid. Stop. Are you serious? Yes. Oh, I mean, I mean, they must have very shiny hair. Good for them. But it's it's a big part of how we're raised. Like genetics is a huge like do the test so you can have a healthy baby, you know, and I don't know, like we're at a higher risk as a community. And I just wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be somebody who actively helps my community, but also helps people who are dealing with very, very difficult things. And I know that sounds strange because, again, like it's I always genetic counseling, a lot of specialties. And I always say like cancer, that's like a specialty is actually the least depressing. Like it's just not everybody knows who's coming to you. They know they have cancer. You're a helper in that process. Prenatal genetics can be very tough. There are times where where it's been hard emotionally for me, especially during my training. There was one day when we were in England where like I left and I came home and I was like, I need to not <laughs> I need to not see bad things just for like an hour. Like I need to watch TV and disassociate from this because it was very heavy for me. But I I love what I do. And I love, I love being a part of somebody's journey, especially when it's good news, especially when they come back to me and they're going to have their healthy baby because we've done all the testing and all the prerequisites to help them through. I love that. I, I love helping people who are struggling. Like it's a unique talent. Let's talk about some other genetic pools that we have in the Jewish community. We did talk about Ashkenazi, obviously. What are some other considerations or information that Jews who don't fall into the Ashkenazi category should be aware of? I, I really want to say this. Maybe like a hundred years ago when we were all in our little like shtetls in Poland, like and in Morocco and in Iran, we were very separate and had very distinct gene pools. Even if you think that you're 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, you are not. I, I guarantee there are some small drops in there from other places. Which brings me to like when I taught in high school, I taught biology for many years. I taught in a school with a lot, a big Persian population. And I remember whenever we were doing genetics, they're like, we're Persian, we're good. Our genetics are the best. And I was like, that's definitely true. But anybody, Jewish, non-Jewish, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, Mizrahi, anybody can be a carrier for anything. If you have any Jewish ancestry, so meaning even if you're like one quarter Jewish, you had a grandparent that was Jewish, you should get tested for Jewish disorders. And there are specific things, like I'll give an example, familial Mediterranean fever. That's a condition that's more prevalent in people who have Sephardic descent. You should get tested just to be like a little controversial on your show. I think the reason that the Ashkenazi Jews, like we just get a lot of airtime is because there's just been a lot more research done in our community. So it's not that the other communities aren't at risk, but it's just that we've put a lot of money, efforts, and resources into researching our community. And those communities are at risk, but they just may not know because we're not, I don't know, advertising as well about them. We're not researching them well, as well. Can I say that they're more superstitious as a culture? And I know I'm lumping <laughs> many different types of people together, but there is something about Spartak Hashkafa. Maybe. I'm sure it exists in Ashkenazic too. Uh, we could just leave it at that. I will leave it at that. I will say like there also is just a lot of buy-in in the Ashkenazi community because of things like Doria Sharon. And that is something that like I know more Haredi Sephardic Jews will use also. But the, the, the buy-in isn't necessarily there. But NYU testing is probably helpful for Sephardi Jews. 
any no. testing is helpful for Sparty yeah. Jews, 100 percent. It doesn't have to be NYU. You can use any lab. I just feel like Stern, YU, we know about that because they just they're good with the marketing. Mm -hmm. But you can I mean, you can do any lab in the country as long as the panel's good. It is good. I just will say, like, if you're not and I, I struggle with this a little bit because the Haredi community is really great with Doria Sharon. But if you're not in the Haredi bucket, the carrier testing thing, it's not not everybody does it. Um, like I taught in London Orthodox high schools. Some parents don't want their kids to do that. Some kids don't want to do that. Like you said, because of, I don't know superstition, but stigma. Like, I don't want to find out my kid has a non-working well, that's gene. That's what, with Dory Sharm, they don't tell you if you're a carrier or not. Their whole system is, you're just told if you're a match or not. Right, exactly. But if you're not in that Haredi world then you're not doing shidduch dating, you're not necessarily going to follow that path, which is, right. it's interesting. But there's been other organizations that have popped up, like J-Screen, that have popped up to try and deal with, I guess, the more modern Orthodox community. Let's wrap up. Tell us if there is one message that we'd like to spread and you have this platform, what would it be? That we as prenatal genetic counselors are, are here to help you. And, you know, if you are somebody who is pregnant, who's interested in learning about testing or has had maybe some, you know, testing results that weren't what they expected, it's very helpful to meet with a genetics professional to really assess what risk you have and to use that as, you know, part if you are somebody who's going to a rev, to use that as part of the information to help make a decision that's that's going to halakhically affect your pregnancy if that's the route or just in general to help you, you know, prepare for the pregnancy. Tell us a little bit more about your personal infertility journey. So with my own fertility journey, I got married very young in my early 20s. Never knew anybody who had gone through infertility. Like the people that I knew who went through infertility were like the Ima host and thought I'm for sure going to get pregnant because that's just what people do. They get married and they get pregnant. We found out pretty, I wouldn't say early, but probably about a year and a half to two years in that it was going to be very, very difficult for us to get pregnant on our own. And we went through like a really long process of treatments and doctors and testing and just all the really horrible hardship that can be an infertility journey we went through. With an infertility journey, there are ups and there are downs. I feel very lucky that our infertility journey ended in a baby. So after we were married for four years, we had my first son. The process was really terrible and it was a roller coaster to say the least. And, you know, with infertility, there's no guarantees. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I think a big part of why I do what I do, and I think this is a question you asked me, why do you do what you do? Like you, you're in a very difficult field was because, you know, with my own journey, I felt a lot of solace and a lot of just help and love from the people who were on my care team. While they couldn't necessarily give me a baby, which is what I wanted, they were able to help guide me through a very, very difficult process. And I wanted to be that for someone. I wanted to be somebody who could help guide someone on their own genetic journey, uh, whatever that may be. One other point that I wanted to share about my fertility journey is just how isolating it felt for me going through that journey when everyone around you is on a path and you cannot be on that path. It's really, really hard. And for me, that path was everyone around me was getting married and getting pregnant and having baby after baby after baby. And there I was just, you know, not able to get pregnant. And there was a lot of, I guess, shame that I had felt like consistently, like, why can't I get pregnant? This is unfair. Everyone else gets pregnant. And I felt really, really alone. And the other thing was that at least when I was going through it, nobody talked about infertility in my community. It was a very hush-hush thing. So nobody really knew what I was going through. I think a lot of people assumed that and made a lot of very inappropriate, uncomfortable comments. It was very, very isolating. And I think People with, just bringing this back to the whole genetics thing that we're talking about, people who are going through illness, illness, whether that's infertility or a family member that has a genetic illness, there's a lot of feeling of isolation and there's a lot of feeling of people just don't get it. Um, I consistently felt like people just didn't get it. Again, something that I 
try to do in my practice is provide a space where there can be someone who maybe doesn't understand exactly what you're going through, but can empathize with you and provide that love. And that is something that I am, I'm very, very passionate about. And through this infertility journey as well, besides for the genetic counseling, a big part of what I do is advocacy and helping out people in our community who are going through infertility in whatever way I can, whether that's being a friend or a mentor um, or speaking sometimes for, you know, organizations that advocate for people with infertility. And while this particular challenge in my life was horrible and really, really, really scarred me in so many different ways. I think I've been very blessed that I've been able to turn that experience into something meaningful for me that drives me and helps me do better in the world and really makes me feel like I have purpose. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. I'm like a big fan of your show. So it, it's you. cool to meet. I am a Fran stan. It's cool to meet the Fran in person. Ah, it's such an honor. And thank you for reaching out and making this episode happen. And that's how many of our episodes happen. It's because it's not because I know about all the topics out there. It's because I have lots of interesting and smart people who are doing important things who reach out and say this is worth sharing and thank you of course if anyone wants to reach out to you how can they find you your instagram is lots of bracha right lots of bracha on instagram find me there and if you need something else we'll go from there but that's really the best way brand stance thank you for listening until the end Make sure to check out and look out for the Misha Nechnas Adar song, the collab song that I put together in the last few weeks. It's my tune, and the words are Misha Nechnas Adar. Also, check out my EP. The links are in the show notes. I am looking to do more No More Silence episodes on this podcast, so if you or you know anyone who is a survivor of abuse in the firm community, feel free to suggest them or send them my way. I am a success podcast coach, so I help others start and launch their podcast. I have an online course that takes you step by step and you can do it on your own. So that is linked in the show notes as well. What else? If you'd like to support the show, if you'd like to sponsor the show, there are a few ways you can do that. Number one, you can like, follow the show. You can leave a review on whichever app you are listening to. And if you haven't done that yet, Make sure to download an app, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. If you're streaming this from my website, make sure you go and listen to it from the app. This way you get notifications every time a new episode is released. Next, you can recommend this show to other people, which you are doing. And I am so, so grateful to you. This is how we grow the show. These are ways that you support me without sending dollars But if you would still like to send me dollars, I appreciate it so, so much because it does go a long way. And I want to shout out to my booby for sponsoring this week's episode. And let's keep the high spirits going and the happy spirits going because it's not always easy to be happy on demand. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you have a fantastic week. Keep reaching out. I love hearing from you. And see you next time. 